You just asked ChatGPT for a little bit of advice on metabolic health and fasting, but it ended up backfiring. You felt worse and you actually gained a little bit. What if ChatGPT didn't actually know all the science? What if it was just predicting patterns and had lots of gaps in the information it provided? This could be problematic when it comes down to how you're going about intermittent fasting. It's almost like we're getting weird information and it's kind of wild. Sometimes ChatGPT can even hallucinate and fill gaps with what it thinks makes sense. So I've got 11 things that ChatGPT got wrong when it came down to fasting. And these are important nuances that we need to pay attention to. So we'll cover the limitations of ChatGPT for health information and metabolic information in the first place. And then we'll go into the actual things it got wrong with intermittent fasting. And then I'll throw a few things in there that ChatGPT can't give you. I'll give you practical tips that you can apply to your fasting to get more out of it. ChatGPT predicts patterns and it summarizes information and it does it really, really well, but it can only do it with information that it's been trained on and it can't always have up-to-date information. The other limitation is that it's going to lack context. It can't factor in debate. It can't factor in real context. So when you have these nuances of science and nuances of metabolic health and fasting and even fat loss for that matter, a lot of times it's going to default to what the biggest lowest hanging fruit is without taking context into consideration it cannot weigh the quality of evidence. That's something that we sort of understand. Eventually, it could probably establish a bias, but it can't look at a weak study versus a strong study. It can only look at the numbers and the patterns that exist in it. But the worst thing is, and the part that could actually be kind of dangerous, and I'll give you some examples in a minute, is that it can hallucinate, which means if it doesn't see that it has all the information necessary, it can actually create its own information and fill these gaps because its role is to complete the task, not to always give you the accurate information. The reason that I first learned about this is I asked ChatGPT how I should break my fast. And I recognize that it gives different people different answers, but essentially it gave me a vague answer about managing calories in and calories out. And although I understand that that's important, it really left out the important nuance of nutrient quality and being able to get adequate amounts of the right food and protein at the end of a fast. If I was to just focus on calories in, calories out after a fast, I could go to Mickey D's and get a sausage McMuffin and meet all my calorie goals and be totally fine, but I'd be lacking those micro micronutrients and those minerals that are required for me to repair after that period of a fast. Which leads me to number two, it doesn't understand metabolic gridlock. Metabolic gridlock is a fascinating thing to discuss in the first place, and there's a lot of nuance there. Metabolic gridlock is where when you have so much of a bunch of different nutrients coming in at once, the mitochondria has a hard time substrate switching and understanding what to use. It's essentially going to prioritize whatever it thinks it needs at that point in time. So that could be quite damaging to the mitochondria. We've literally seen that there can be an inflammatory response from an influx of too many nutrients coming in at once. And we've seen it in extreme situations with what's called refeeding syndrome, but that's not going to happen for most people that are intermittent fasting. The bottom line is we shouldn't be taking in a bunch of fuel all at once. We kind of want to ease some food in so that our body has the ability to assimilate nutrients and kind of get its insulin sensitivity squared away. We're highly insulin sensitive at the end of a fast, so we kind of want to capitalize on that with a little bit of protein and perhaps keeping the fat content a little bit lower so we're not blunting that sensitivity. If I just focused on getting enough calories in, well, I would be throwing that all to the wind, quite frankly. ChatGPT doesn't always understand the gut health piece with intermittent fasting. With fasting, yes, you're giving your gut a break, and that's great. It allows for more motility and it allows for cleanup and stem cell production within the gut. But what it fails to mention is that we also lose some of our gut barrier integrity when we fast, which means that when we introduce food back into the system, we need to go kind of easy on it. Why? Because our gut mucosal layer is a little bit broken down. So even though we'd be wanting to get a bunch of fiber and healthy things in, it's not always the best time to load up on fiber when our gut mucosal layer is broken down. These are the little nuances, the little things that you want 
want to lean into good information and do your own research and not just default to ChatGPT all the time. I've said for the last 10 years of making fasting content that one of the more important things you should do when you're fasting is take care of your gut health. That means a good probiotic. That means good fermented food over fiber, fermented dairy, even fermented veggies. Focus on those first before you focus on the fiber because those are going to be the biggest drop in the bucket for you. I put a link for the probiotic that I recommend. It's one called Seed. That's a 25% off discount link. Definitely recommend if you're fasting or you're doing any kind of metabolic overhaul that you prioritize your gut health. So they have published a lot of clinical studies. They put their money where their mouth is and it has a really cool delivery technology that I've talked about. So it's really good for people that are fasting. I would recommend taking it after you break your fast, but after you've kind of digested that break fast meal, and then maybe another one before bed. So you actually have a, a chance for them to colonize properly and get to the right place. So that link is down below. Chat GPT will generally tell you that while you're fasting, you should be aware of your energy output and not exert yourself. And this might be just an over precautionary thing. That's the other thing we have to be aware of. It doesn't take that bio individuality into account. So for example, when you are fasting, this is one of the most important times to be resistance training. It reminds the body that even though you're in a severe deficit right now, that your muscle is important. And if you don't use it, you will lose it. So you want to put some tension on the muscle so that your metabolism says, hey, this muscle is metabolically relevant and it's helpful and it's important. Don't waste it away. The biggest driver of muscle protein synthesis is the stimulus, not the protein itself. But what if ChatGPT was giving advice that was completely throwing people in a weird direction? What if it was discounting a lot of the important nuance that really gets people to want to fast in the first place? Insulin resistance is a perfect example. Chat GPT or other AI models might tell you that intermittent fasting or low carb is going to increase insulin resistance. This is something that takes a lot of debate and context to understand because there's still debates on YouTube that don't take the entire picture into the equation, let alone a large language model. So with Chat GPT, it could potentially say, hey, fasting is going to cause insulin resistance. Well, there's nuance because what happens is called peripheral insulin resistance. And it happens because your body is low in carbohydrates or low in fuel, it actually increases a peripheral insulin resistance so that you have available fuel. It's actually helping you. It's not making you pathologically insulin resistant. It's not a chronic insulin resistance. It is peripheral and it is there to maintain your glucose levels a little bit higher when you're in a fuel-deprived state. It's perfectly normal and it is not a long-term chronic thing. Number six, it won't put context of calories over the course of a week. It's been really difficult to get ChatGPT to understand that you don't need X number of calories in a given day. Why? Because there's not a lot of studies that put it into that exact language or pattern, and it might take time for it to understand. So with fasting, for example, I might eat zero calories one day, but eat 5,000 calories the next day. Most models will think that that's a lot of food for one day, but if I didn't eat the day before, I'm at a net neutral at ultimately. So I look at my calories over the course of a week. This is the kind of thing where anecdote and even fringe research and people's experience matter because most of the evidence just leans into the calories in, calories out model, which is important, but it doesn't factor in the nuance. It doesn't factor in that calories in, calories out can be over the course of a week, possibly even a month. What if you're really stressed out? Like, what if you're having a rough day, you're sleep deprived? What about that? That's where ChatGPT can also really fail us. Okay, if we're looking at, say, our ability to fast or when we should fast, if you are stressed out and Mary is not and Jim is not, you're going to have three wildly different types of fasting that you should consider or if you should even fast in the first place. If you are stressed out, you do not want to follow the conventional fasting advice. You probably shouldn't fast that much when you're extra stressed or when you're super sleep deprived or when you feel like you're getting sick or whatnot. That's a time where you're adding extra stress to the body and it may not see it like that. So that's that bio-individuality that we need to be paying attention to. Number eight is it seems to always lean into precaution versus human experience. So fasting to a lot of people and to a lot of patterns that it's probably picking up is dangerous or scary or fringe. When in reality, you're watching this channel, I've been talking about fasting for years and years and years, you understand that this is a perfectly normal human thing to go through, to go periods of time without food. We have just somehow adjusted to the constant consumption and just the consumer mentality of just eating, eating, eating and grazing because that's, well, that's 
That's what's been taught to us, right? But we can absolutely go long periods of time or at least a few hours without food. So the constant precaution puts people on edge. So sometimes you have to hear real experience. And since ChatGPT can't read videos, it can't look at YouTube, it can't watch people's experience and active discussion, it makes it quite difficult. The next one is it doesn't factor in the fringe things like mitochondrial biogenesis or mitophagy. It seems to default once again to calories in, calories out, which on one hand is really important because I do think that most people should just understand basic energy balance. But I do also think when you're starting to get into these specific things, you need to understand that there's more than just calories in, calories out. Mitochondrial biogenesis, for example, you're able to get benefits of exercise when you're fasting. Benefits like more mitochondrial density, more energy availability, basically after the fast, you're getting all these other benefits at the mitochondrial level that you really have to prompt it for. So if I want basic advice on fasting, everything defaults to the absolute core basics, which doesn't exactly convince me to fast. As a matter of fact, it kind of deterred me if I were to look at it with really virgin eyes, so to speak. Number 10, it doesn't stack benefits. It doesn't understand that just yet. That's really nuanced, right? For example, fasting induces autophagy. Okay, exercise induces autophagy. Well, you'd have to actually ask it, what would happen if I stacked these two? And then it would have to go into really fringe research, which it quite frankly can't look at very well. In my honest opinion, Gemini is a little bit better for that, but it's going to essentially give you the basics. But reality is, for autophagy, for example, if you were to do some exercise in a fasted state, you are stacking autophagy benefits. You do get autophagy when you exercise. You get more autophagy when you exercise than you do when you fast. But you get even more autophagy if you exercise during a fast. And these are the kinds of things where you have to learn through context and through a little bit of connect the dots, as Dr. Rhonda Patrick would say. We don't want to get too lost in mechanistic weeds, but we also need to know that there's more than what's just black and white. And what's beyond just black and white is not a made-up gray area hallucination that ChatGPT gave you. It's the real truth of what happened in that gray area. Number 11, it does not look at edge case populations because it's not looking at the small studies. And even if it does, it's probably got them wrong. So pregnant people, adolescents, people with different metabolic conditions, quite frankly, healthy people. A lot of the studies on fasting are actually done in metabolically unhealthy people. So sometimes it's really hard to find studies on good, healthy cohorts. This skews the data because a healthy person might respond different to fasting than someone that's dealing with metabolic issues. In a moment, we're going to go into some things that you can do to improve your fasting and get more out of it. But I want to throw one more bonus thing that ChatGPT does, and you've probably noticed this. It validates the ever-living heck out of everything. If you ask it something, it's going to try to make you feel good and become your friend. Personally, I don't want that. I want someone to tell me like it is and tell me straight. I don't want someone to validate and sugarcoat everything for me and ultimately make me confused about what I asked it in the first place. I think we need to exercise some caution on becoming too friendly with ChatGPT. It's almost like it's the weaselly little friend or weaselly little neighbor that's trying to sneak in and hang out with your wife, if you know what I mean. That didn't actually really happen, just so you know, my neighbors are cool. Here's a few things that you can do to get more out of your fast. Exercise in a fasted state. And if you want to burn more fat, exercise as deep in a fast as you possibly can. Secondly, break your fast with lean protein. That's still the rule. Lean protein, low fat, low carbohydrate, just the straight lean protein, and then 30 or 60 minutes later, have a larger meal. You just want to break that fast, get that mitochondria getting some fuel in it, getting those digestive enzymes rolling, and then introduce more food. Adding a sauna to a fast can boost the growth hormone surge that you already get from fasting. Now, there's crazy science out there that says that fasting boosts growth hormone by thousands of percent. That's kind of real science, but it's not really real, right? You do get a growth hormone surge though, but you get an even stronger growth hormone surge from sitting in a sauna. Sitting in a sauna while fasted, even more beneficial. If you're trying to fast for gut health, it's not a bad idea to add a little bit of bone broth to a fast. Get a little bit of benefit there from the collagen, from the gelatin. It can actually help you out a little bit. And frankly, it's barely going to break your fast. So if you start feeling like, hey, I want to have a little bit of fuel, I need a little something, a little bone broth could help satiate you and make you feel a lot better. 
Another trick that a lot of people don't realize is that electrolytes do actually give you energy. Okay, it's not just like, hey, these are mineralizing and these are hydrating. They are that, but we're starting to learn more quantum energy dynamics of the mitochondria. We're learning that magnesium actually helps what's called a membrane potential. So this is actually allowing energy gradients to work better in the mitochondria. Minerals are literally giving us energy. They're not just providing us with minerals like we thought in the general sense. Another quick trick is to rotate your fasting times. Sometimes fast through the morning, sometimes fast through the evening. Switch it up so that you're getting the benefits of different times of day under the influence of a fast. Because you get different cellular effects when you're fasting in the morning with certain cortisol levels where they're at compared to fasting in the evening. And then occasionally try skipping lunch. Do what's called a metabolic micro fast, where you eat breakfast and you skip lunch and then you eat dinner. These little things make a big difference. Keeps the body guessing a little bit and it allows you to receive a different benefit. So just to recap, ChatGPT should not be your number one source for health information. But really, ChatGPT leaves a lot to be desired. Personally, Gemini for searching PubMed might be a little bit better if you're a science nerd, but you also just want to take context. One of the things that we're learning through this is that people are less rigid about the science now, and they're more open to the woo-woo, and they're more open to the anecdote, which personally, I think anecdote overlaid with real science is the place to be. You know, I did a video on some of the mistakes that I've made with fasting, and it might help you to watch that video because it gives new context into how I fast differently now compared to five or six years ago. So that video is right here. As always, I'll see you tomorrow.